Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to another study in the Word. This is Pastor Tom. Thank you for joining me. And today we're going to do our fifth session on raising kids in troubled times, or raising kids, whatever you want to call it. And a, an important situation because of the times we're living in, this information will be a blessing to you. So turn to James chapter 1, and as you're going, I want to encourage you to go to our website, faithalivefellowship.org. It is there that you can find uh, free seminars, and uh, you'll find a, a donation button if you want to become a partner with us or you'd like to give an offering toward the, the ministry as we are uh, really uh, is kind of uh, in the mode right now of preparing for another uh, Skype crusade in Pakistan this week, and uh, those are always fruitful. Uh, we average anywhere from 150 to 200 souls coming into the kingdom of God a week through our outreaches. So it's good ground. And uh, that's faithalifefellowship.org. In James chapter 1, we're going to uh, start reading at verse 16. And we'll read down through here because this gives us some real good advice uh, about children and raising children. In verse 16, it says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. I'm reading to you out of the, the King James Version. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable, is neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I'm going to stop right there, and I want to uh, talk about these, these very important verses. Now, where he says, verse 17, every good gift, notice that, and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. With her, there's no variables, neither shadow of turning. Our minds, or at least my mind, uh, used to always go to the goodness of God, uh, all the good things that happen in life, the good gifts that we have, uh, you know, have been given through uh, Him, things like the gifts of the Spirit, and so on. Those things are all true. God is good. And he's always given us good gifts as children. However, what he's really talking about here in context is that you and me and any person born on this earth really is a good gift given to the world. Uh, in essence, we are gifts given to the world. And uh, within our gift, our destiny, you can use that term, the role we are to play through uh, uh, this earth, okay, the um, inside of us are many gifts and talents that make up that gift. So uh, it's very important for us to find our place, find what it is we're really called to do. By that, I would mean our main function on this planet. By doing so, then and only then can we be fulfilled in, in God's kingdom. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is that it's very, perfectly vital, very vital, to make sure that our children, our little children, since they're infants, you begin to teach them that they are good gifts. They are perfect gifts. Inside them, God has created them the ability to be a blessing and to reach uh, uh, their full potential and destiny in Jesus Christ. If they will carefully allow those gifts to be strengthened, they'll find out where they're supposed to be functioning find out from the Lord what it is they're supposed to be doing, and they can fulfill the role. And this, this causes great um, happiness in life. It causes great uh, joy, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, to know that you're, you're functioning and doing God's perfect will. And the children need to know that God has uh, created them. They're not junk. They, they are gifts. Their personalities are unique. Their talents are unique all going to be different. Then we have the spiritual gifts that are unique, the callings in, in, as far as the spiritual part of us. But always remember, we're not just a spirit being. We have a soul and we have a body. So we might have physical gifts that are unique. Some people are athletes. You might have talents uh, emotionally, uh, um, mentally that are unique. Some people are writers. Some people are artists. Some people are uh, um, painters, uh, you know. Uh, you could go down a long line, writers, so on. And finding those things is vitally important within the concept of what I'm talking about today. And for children, you need to help them realize their potential, find out where they dwell, and, and, and begin to focus on that. It's important. 
And we'll talk about that more as we go. And it says that the, because he begot us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This word creatures here, first fruits of his creatures, is really a colony. It speaks of a colony of people. And we know he's talking about, of course, the church here. A colony of people on this earth that are unique, gifted, good gifts, qualified, perfect gifts, qualified, if our gifts come to maturity, to have the lasting impact. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter 11, I believe it is, uh, I wanted to look at the scripture here before we go back here. And in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says something very interesting here. In verse 11, Matthew 11, verse 11, he says, Verily or truly I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not uh, hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I want you to think about that. So Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest prophet. He, uh, the word greatest here means he had the most influence, the most influence with God, the most influence with man, the most influence, the greater dimension of influence. And, uh, but he says something then that is really interesting because he said John was greater than all the prophets, Moses, Jeremiah, you know, it didn't matter who you talk about in the Old Covenant. Great men all, great women all, but John the Baptist was greater. But then he shocks us by saying, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. In other words, we have tremendous potential to be great on this earth in the sense of our influence, what we're able to do, what we're able to uh, participate in and help humanity with bringing people to Christ, bringing people into the kingdom, advancing whatever goals and whatever destiny God has for us. This is powerful. It's unlimited. And this is something that we have to make sure not only to tell ourselves, but to tell our children for very early ages. They were created for a time such as this. They were created with gifts, talents, anointings, ta and, and everything else. Uh, it's a complete package that, when followed, when carefully found out, when cultivated, become a powerful and awesome force for the living God and will cause these people to fulfill their calling. Now, what the church uh, has done, what the body of Christ has done for so long, is we've kind of uh, separated ourselves out of the world in, in this sense. I know the Bible says that we are to be separate from the world in the way that we live, separate from the world in the way uh, that we believe, and, and so on. That's true. But what we've done is we've kind of uh, made it sound like God just took us out of the world, put us into a little church group over here inside a building somewhere. And church is something we do on uh, Sundays, and then we go and try to make a living, you know, the rest of the time or whatever. This is not Christian thinking. This is not uh, covenant thinking. This is not kingdom thinking. Kingdom thinking should have always been, we are created very powerfully by God Almighty. He sent us down. We are gifts from the Father of lights. We, are, we have, we have the, the commission by God Almighty to go out and not only just preach the gospel to every creature, but to do something that helps humanity to work in our area of giftedness, talents, and so on, to be salt and light, to shine the light, to be leaders. I'm trying to tell you everybody should be being a leader, no matter where you stand. Somebody says, well, Pastor Tom, uh, my main gift or my main talents is, is just being a housewife. Well, just be the best one you can be. And then, you know, share it with others. That's a tremendous and powerful uh, thing with a lot of great impact. I mean, what could be more important than raising your kids? But maybe, hallelujah, that goes into other things. I know my daughter uh, is doing uh, videos on uh, homeschooling. She's using her uh, experiences, what she's called to do, to reach others and to help and to reach out to be a blessing to others. And it's not just at church. You see, that's the thing. That's where we make the that's where we make a, a problem, not just getting involved in church, but getting involved in our communities, getting involved in our jobs, our work. Shouldn't Christians be the head, not the tail, the above and not the beneath? Certainly we should. Shouldn't our children have that mentality 
I know the Jewish people teach their children that from the very beginning. It's very important to them that their children know that they are created for greatness. Well, we should do the same thing. We should be telling our children we're created for greatness. And we have given up uh, our nation over to a bunch of foolishness, and we have to take it back now, which I think we will. But it should have never been that way. We should have been the bankers. We should have been the educators. We should have been in universities, the one running these things. In fact, the devil has come in and stolen almost everything from the church. If you really think about it, he stole the universities that most of the universities were created by Christians or Christianity, Harvard and Yale and so on. Just, just go back and look at the history. It's the same way all the way down the line. You can talk about medical science. You can talk about you know uh, physics. It doesn't matter. You'll find some of the greatest geniuses of our time that are the leaders in their field were Christians. And for many, many years, most of them were when they even started the field. But today, today we have kind of taken a second place in society. We've taken a lot of bunk from the world that we shouldn't take. And we should go out there and we should be very concerned about not just being a Christian and living right, but being salt and light using our gifts, our talents, where God has placed us, and advancing as high as we possibly can into uh, influence, influencing the world with our gifts, talents, and the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and so it's very important that we install these things into our children from an early age. And uh, if you look uh, back here at James chapter 1, if you go down here and you look at... Uh, uh, this scripture here in verse 21, Where, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he will like, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forget what manner of man he is. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man should be blessed in his deed. Now what he's talking about here is your destiny. He's saying God has given us his word to be engrafted into us, just like you eat an apple. That's engrafted into you, it becomes part of you. You eat a donut, it's engrafted into you, it becomes part of you. You eat a big thing of ham. It's engrafted into you. It becomes part of you. Whatever you eat becomes a part of, you, part of you. It's engrafted into you. It's the same way spiritually speaking, mentally speaking, and so on. I don't just study spiritual things. I also study intellectual things. I like history. I learn a lot by that stuff. And I try to keep myself sharp. Because the older I get, the more sharper I want to keep my mind. And the way you keep your mind sharp is by exercising it, right? So I read books all the time. I'm only constantly looking at... At, uh, uh, I have like this audible thing. I like that. I, but it, it causes you to concentrate, causes you to focus. And we've got to do that with our little children. We've got to tell them, look, it's the word of God engrafted into you that becomes part of you that can make you a success in life. You know, Psalms 1, you know, blessed is a man who stands not in the, in the, in the seat of the scornful, uh, nor, you know, nor stands in the way of sinners, but his light is in the law of the Lord. And in this law, he meditates day and night. It'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. that will bring forth his, in his fruit in the season. His leaf shall not wither. And whatsoever he does shall prosper. Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, so that thou mayest have deserved to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Thou shalt have good success. That idea of meditating in the word and then doing the word, acting on it, speaking the word. The word meditation means all those things and more. It's never Eastern meditation. It's always biblical meditation. Eastern meditation is the opposite. It's emptying yourself. Uh, Christian meditation is filling yourself with the word of God, engrafting the word into our hearts. Uh, so anyway, we want our children to understand that. So as they begin to engraft the word into their hearts, it, it's able to save their souls, renew their minds is a better way of saying that. But they, they need to learn not only to hear the word, but to put it into action. And you can do this with your children in uh, many creative ways. Teach them, okay, here's a principle of God's word. How can we put this into action? And a little example of that would be, I noticed that my, uh, my uh, children and my grandchildren 
you know, they give the children uh, uh, money, let's say $10 or something. Uh, well, one dollar of that is for tithe. Then if they want to give an offering, they have another one. So at church, you know, they're going to put their tithe in. That's doing the word. They're learning it from an early age. They also, they want to put an offering in. Maybe they put it into the Pakistan thing. We have a little box for Pakistan money so we can do the crusades and feed the hungry and so on. And this is this is being a doer of the word. Now, that's a simple thing. There's a lot of other ways you can do that, you know. You can teach them the importance of praying. Not only you pray, but they pray. Praying in the spirit. Not only you pray, but they pray. You pray together. You have them pray over the meals. I like doing that. I said, you pray today. If we're at dinner, I don't just say, I'm going to pray. I want them to pray, and, with, and they pray. Uh, you can get them doing the word of God in so many ways, and you can get creative with it. And you can also, I think it's important that they understand the principle of not just looking into this word and hearing it, but putting it into practice. Because if they do that, they will be successful. It will make their way successful. And it's success in life, successful in choosing the right mate, success in marriage, success in raising kids financially every way. This is important to put that right into them from the earliest stages. And if you do that, they'll begin to understand who they are. Hey, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm I'm something special. I have I have gifts from God. God uh, He doesn't create junk. He created me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I have a destiny. He has a plan for me that is a good plan. It's a plan for success and so on. And you put those things into them, make them acting on it, acting on it. One of the ways me and my wife uh, had. Uh, our daughter, uh, when we would go out to witness, we'd go out on the streets. And at the time, we were living in a in an area of California that was highly Hispanic. I worked there uh, in the produce business, highly Hispanic people. And Hispanic people really love to go, like, on, on Saturdays or Sunday afternoon or whatever, to the park, which is a, a great big plaza down there. And they'd all gather down there, and they would play music, and you know have you know have uh, barbecues and so on. And so we used to go down there, and we would carry little tracks with us, and we would go up, and we would just start talking to these Hispanic people. My wife would translate, and my uh, we would hand out tracks and lead them to the Lord, and we, we we led many many people to the Lord. But we kept our daughter was with us. And they always thought that was cute that our daughter would be there with us witnessing. She was part of that. And uh, we, we let her know. Now, see, we're witnessing. This is what you do. And we show them the scriptures. And she she was used to that. By the time she was uh, uh, old enough to, to mingle with the children, she would witness to the children. She, she grew up that way. That was part of her lifestyle. Uh, another thing we did was we took her when we went out to pray for people. We'd knock on doors. And uh, I never had anybody turn me away. When I asked them if I could pray for them, every one of them wanted us to pray for them. And we got into places in homes where we'd go in, me and Stella. We'd pray over a grandma. We'd pray over somebody that was sick. We'd pray over anything. And it was just a way to get in the home, and then we could share the gospel. Another thing is, it was really an interesting story, i got to tell you, about having your, your children with you and teaching them to do the Word of God. Uh, I like to take my children every once in a while, pick one up in a prayer line. And if the anointing comes on me, sometimes if you know our ministry at all, you know that I'll blow on people and they'll fall out or be healed or something will happen to them. That's the anointing that came upon me, uh, you know, uh, over the years. Well, I'll, I'll carry them with me when I'm doing that sometimes. And sometimes I'll even have them, if the anointing comes on them, sometimes there's an anointing that, that'll come on them that's on me and they can do the same thing. I've even had a blow on people and they go out under the power. That's training our children. Have them walk with you in their prayer line. Have them uh, learn tongues and interpretation and prophecy. And uh, this should be going on in children's church. And, you know, people say, oh, we shouldn't do that. How can we do that? They're just children. They're smarter than you think they are. And sometimes they can even be more spiritual than you are. <laughs> so that's what I say about it. I say, hey, let's do that. See, well, we raised our children right in church, got them involved, didn't consider them the children's church. Though we do have children's church, we did not consider them the children's church, we consider them part of our church, part of our body. And sometimes I don't even like send them back to children's church. Sometimes I like them in the service. And I, I feel the same way about teenagers. Sometimes we separate them off. Well, the teenagers are different than everybody else. Well, if you treat them different, they're going to be different. 
But if you treat them like part of the church, part of the body of Christ, get them involved in the church as quickly as possible, finding work and learning how to discipline themselves and get beyond time and all that. It's a great way to teach your children. I remember one time when I established our first church in Reno, Nevada, uh, I was just getting it going. And we didn't have that many people, but uh, we were meeting in my apartment, which was upstairs, and we were living in an apartment at the time. We were young, fairly young, starting out in life and so on, just moved there. And uh, so I thought, you know, I'm going to have a service on, on, on Halloween. So we invited everybody. Nobody really showed up, but there were a few people. There was there was a woman that that uh, uh, I had learned about who was had a, a terrible time uh, with her, her health. She had some kind of a brain lesion thing going on, and for many years, almost twenty years, uh, she was a spiritful woman. A good uh, she loved God. She was filled with the Spirit, tongue talker, loved God, but she had suffered terribly, um, and she went to a cer- certain denominational church that. Uh, did not believe that Christians could have a demon. And so when when there would be an altar call in their church for healing or whatever, she would try to walk forward in this full gospel church and about get about halfway up there and she'd fall out the same with throw her on the ground. And she'd start, um, you know, having a, like an epileptic seizure. And she never got any help. They'd pray for her healing, but that's not what she needed. She needed deliverance from devils. And so... Um, one of the boys in our church was talking to her because he worked with her, saying, you ought to come over there with, with me to church and have Pastor Tom minister to you. And so we're, this was going on for several years. She never showed up. But she all of a sudden that night, at a Halloween service, she showed up. Then we had another lady that showed up at the church that night. She was a new lady, but her ministry was to reach out to the uh, uh, prisoners. And so she would go in there and she'd hold services for the prisoners. If the prisoners uh, were doing good and being good model citizens in there, they would at times let them out and she could take them uh, to church service and then bring them back. And so she brought six prisoners. So we had this lady with the epileptic seizures who was hooked on drugs because they gave her drugs, had all these uh, problems demonically, six prisoners. (laughs) And so... We started praying for them that night, and we were, we, I was sharing the word and did my service. And then I said, does anybody need healing or anything? And she raised her hand, and so I laid hands on her, and she fell out under the power. But to my surprise, all of a sudden, man, this thing, it was, like, it was almost like a, a donkey in a, in, a, in a tin barn or a, a roar of a, of a wild animal come out of her, just loud. When that happened, you know, it shocked me. But then I, I steadied myself and I just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her, you know, real strong. When I did that, the six prisoners fell out and started manifesting. So we had seven people that we were having to cast devils out of in that one service, just right there. The power got hit them, knocked them out, and they started manifesting. My daughter, who was just a little girl at five years old, had been taught about these things. Didn't hesitate, went right over there, jumped on top of him, started casting the devil out of him. And God used her to cast devils out. She's she's cast a lot of devils out in her, her day. Doing the word. Your children will find out Christianity is exciting when they're involved in doing the word. If you're going to pray for somebody, have them lay hands on them too and pray for them. Sometimes children will get a better response than you will because they are, a lot of them have more faith than we do because it's a childlike faith. And Jesus said, remember, let the children come to me. You know, uh, when they work, when we're worshiping, get them involved in worshiping. One of the things I really like that we do here, sometimes we'll have a, a an upbeat worship service. They'll run around the building or they're, they're, they'll dance, they're, they'll spin, they're, whatever. It's awesome to get children involved, to be doers of the word and not just hearers. I know, I'll never forget a service we had not too long ago every year, uh, except for this year. I'm not going. I think I've only missed I'll be three years. In the last maybe 20 years, my pastor has a camp meeting in California, in Madera. We go out there to camp meeting. Normally, I preach uh, a service or two. And then we'll go out to Pismo Beach, all of us together. Uh, and we've been doing this for a long time. It's one of the religious traditions I believe in, you know. And uh, it's in March, which helps a lot here. 
<laughs> getting out of here at the end of winter. So uh, we went out there and, you know, that night I was sitting there and Stella got up and she was helping, encouraging people to worship and people were dancing and stuff. And uh, I was going to minister and I really didn't have anything from the Lord as far as uh, a word or anything. I just, it was kind of like, wow, I don't know what God's going to do here. It's just going to be one of those things I'm going to have to wait and just see. And uh, as they were worshiping, I noticed this little boy was spinning around and around and around, jumping up and spinning, you know, and uh, I just really was blessed by that. So anyway, when I when I began to minister, I, I decided I was going to do the minister to people by having them sit down and grow out their legs and all that. And sometimes I'll do that. We were doing that, and I was having the, the pastor's son help me. And then all of a sudden, I, I got up and I walked just walked that way. And I noticed this little boy that had been worshiping and, uh, I called him by his name and I said, uh, would you like to help me? And he said, yeah. So he jumps up and he comes up. Now he's five years old. So I, I, I just felt impressed to blow on him. I blew on him and he, he fell out. And while he was laying there, you could see the anointing of God come on him. So he gets up and I go, now let's go over and pray for this. We got the next person in there that needed, had a back healing or something. And he started praying. I said, pray as strong as you can. So he starts praying. The power got hit this guy, this big old heavy set man. Hit him, knocked him out of the chair when this little boy was praying for him and rolled him across the room and he hit the wall. And everybody's mouth went, you know, it was funny to watch because a lot of parents had never had that happen when they pray for people. So I started using him. And then I started pulling out different kids and teenagers. And I, I did the same thing. I'd blow on them as the Lord led me. Then they would minister I remember the the pastor's son uh, or grandson, uh, I brought him up and there was a whole new uh, family that I hadn't seen there. And they were sitting in a, one row there in the church. And I said, are you guys new? And they said, yeah, pretty new. I said, are you a family? And they yeah, come on up. I felt impressed to have him come up. And I said now to his son, after I had blown on him and he was helping me minister, his grandson, the pastor's grandson, he gets up. I go, go blow on them. So he goes with that, blows on them, and then boom, power God hit him and knocked them all down. The devil started coming out of them, out of that family. And uh, they were delivered from some things. See, this is this is how we chain our children. Children, I like them to be in service sometimes. I like I I understand sometimes there's you know the children's church that they can be a special service, but I, I like to have them in, in service. And if I come as a guest speaker, a lot of times I ask, <coughs> could we keep the children in? Can we keep the teenagers in? Because if I'm going to be ministering like that, I do that when I travel sometimes. And uh, that changed me that night. It changed, I think it changed uh, everybody that was there. It blew, blew us away. We saw how God can mightily use children or teenagers just every bit as strong as he can, as he can in growing up. And so don't limit God. Teach your children. We do that in all these ways and more. You can get really creative with it. But I've run out of time. I hope you've enjoyed that. And listen, if you have, please share this. That's how these videos get around. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page here. But not only that, we have a playlist. Go to our playlist up there. Some of you don't do this yet. You don't go to the playlist because every, like this, this particular one will be a, a playlist uh, and, and the more we do, we'll, we'll add the playlist, add them to the playlist. So you can go in the playlist one through 20 or whatever and listen to them all and get everything you need to get out of that, you know, ongoing teaching. Uh, there's a playlist on Romans, the verse by verse. There's a, we have about 40 of them. And I'm teaching about 40 series at one time, which uh, doesn't happen overnight, but over a period of time, I get them, get them all and I'll do more and, and add them. And uh, it's like a Bible school. But if you go to those playlists, you can find out the subjects that you're really interested in or the ones the Lord is leading you to listen to. You can listen to them, and they're, they're, most of them are pretty in-depth teaching. If if not, if I only have a few of them, it's just because I'm, I'm still doing some more, and we'll continue to do them and add them. So uh, you can do that. Now, remember to go to our website, faithalivefellowship.org, where we have free seminars there. You can jump onto our uh, Facebook and Twitter and all that. And uh, you can donate and become a partner with us if God so leads you, which we need people to partner with us. And uh, just the more people we have partnering with us, the more we can do. It's just that simple. Well, 
I have preached myself happy, and I've run out of time. Until next time, this is Pastor Tom. Remember this, always feed your faith, starve your doubts to death. Until next time, God bless.